Welcome to the talk show Promising Bangladesh, sponsored by Crown Cement. Viewers, today we have invited two special guests, and they are very important in the context of foreign policy of Bangladesh. And they are one is Mr. Tohid Hussain, former foreign secretary, other being Mr. Shahidul Haq, former foreign secretary. And this is a rare opportunity for me to invite these two personalities together here. And today our talks mainly rotate around geopolitics and the recent election in Bangladesh. Well, Mr. Tohid Hussain, you were the Foreign Secretary of Bangladesh and as if you were the store of so many information from the standpoint of international relations, diplomacy. What is your recent realization about the geopolitics centering Bangladesh? Thank you. Uh, let me be very clear from the beginning that uh, I am not privy to any confidential information. It's only what I see around, what, I, what comes to me from the media itself, and then a little bit of my own uh, you know, thinking that what can happen uh, after this. Um, I think a, an important change that has taken place, we all are aware of that uh, in recent years, is that um, the, the belief that uh, the West looks at Bangladesh through the eyes of India. That was a prevailing um, you know, belief for a very long time, but then I think that has changed. And the West now looks at Bangladesh uh, as Bangladesh, not just uh, through India. Uh, this is an important development, and because Bangladesh has become more important country, Bangladesh's economy has grown, and uh, our interactions with the wider world has also increased a lot. So that is the basic premise on which we should think about uh, geopolitics of uh, geopolitics of the region around Bangladesh. Um, in the regional context, also things have changed. Uh, you see the uh, footprint of China. Uh, we had for a very long time very close and substantial relations with China, but the Chinese footprint has uh, changed in the positive for, a, uh, for the last 10-15 uh, years. And uh, at the same time, um, relations with the uh, regional hegemon, India, has also uh, intensified between the particularly during the uh, regime of the present government for the last 15 years. Um, although these two countries are uh, mutually antagonistic on many of their uh, interest, uh, issues of interest, uh, their interests in the political situation in Bangladesh has converged, which is that both these um, great powers has preferred that the uh, regime of the present government, with whom they are both comfortable, should continue. And the 2024 election has uh, uh, given such a result, which is um, w with which both these uh, great powers are comfortable with. Before the election, I think it was, it was for the first time that it, there has been such a polarization had taken place. The uh, important powers of the world had become uh, very clearly polarized. On one side was India, China, and Russia, and on the other, uh, the USA, Euro, uh, EU, or what we uh, euphemistically call the West. And they had very uh, distinct opposing positions. One was that, let the elections be as it is, as the government is planning, let it go on. Whereas the West had wanted that uh, there should be a quote-unquote free, fair, credible, and uh, participatory elections. Um, now clearly, the election that has been conducted has not gone um, with what the West had wanted. So when the reactions to the uh, results of the election came in. It was predictably uh, in, the, in the line uh, of this polarization. These three countries very quickly congratulated the government. Uh, whereas the, if we look at the wordings of uh, UK, USA, European Union, to some extent, 
we see a little difference, which is that um, both the UK and the USA has said that this election has not been free and fair. Um, and EU position also similar to that. Now the question is that, why so much of interest in the Bangladesh election? Again, because the players on both sides have been involved in the geopolitics of the region, particularly since the uh, Indo-Pacific strategy that has been uh, developed by the US. Not really the US, it started with Japan, if I remember, and then it, but the main uh, proponent now is the US. They have a sort of interest which doesn't always, uh, particularly in the Indian Ocean region, it doesn't always uh, in conformity with what the Indians want. The US uh, desires and the Indian uh, position doesn't tally exactly. Uh, on the issue of containing China, they are with each other, but then otherwise the India would have, uh, would like an Indian Ocean uh, that is their backwater. So. Uh, they would want the U.S. as some sort of a uh, aiding power, but not the main uh, player in this region. They want to remain the main player in this region. So what the U.S. will do is, uh, I think, uh, to be seen and to be observed for the uh, coming months. That's what uh, my understanding is. Uh, just because they have said that uh, the elections have not been free and fair doesn't mean that they will go take action against the government. Although there are certain indications about, uh, for example, uh, visa restrictions. Now, visa restrictions is something which perhaps the US, in my opinion, they will perhaps be going ahead with uh, imposing this uh, on a good number of people perhaps. But this is something which is not a public thing because they will do it privately to individuals. They will not announce that we have blacklisted this person or that person. I think the, if, if it restricted to that, the government can handle that. Mm -hmm. There will be some problems, uh, but uh, it will not uh, spell any serious problem for the country's economy. Um, unless uh, the US decides to go beyond that. Mm -hmm. If they do not, then I don't think there will be any problem. I think I'll stop here and then uh, maybe we can put some other words afterwards. Thank you very much. Mr. Shahid Lok, you held the office of the Foreign Secretary for long over seven years on the world. What is your understanding which is taking place at this very moment in Bangladesh, especially China and India, which are not on good terms at all, but on points of Bangladesh, they are on the same boat. What are the magics here? Good. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you are absolutely correct that uh, on the Bangladesh election, uh, both India and, and China uh, visibly expressed uh, the same position, uh, continuation of the government for the purpose of stability. Now, before we go into that, I think, uh, you know, since the title is geopolitics and, and Bangladesh, uh, I think we need to sort of uh, loosely look at what geopolitics is. Uh, geopolitics is a way of studying interaction <coughs> between and among the states based on three factors. One is the geography, the second is the demography, and the third is the economy. So if you look at these three indicators and, and then the um, uh, policies, uh, you will see that all the three factors or drivers of geopolitics is in the process of changing, changing very fast. Mm. So that's why we see that 22, 23, 24 uh, continue to remain a tumultuous time. It is more than a change, even little additional than transformation. So that's one. The second is, for some reason or other from, say, late 70s, early 80s uh, of the last century, uh, America became the uh, unipolar force. It really had the uh, power and authority to intervene in anywhere they wish and, and control. So that gave them a, a quite a bit of a leverage. But it did not continue. They lost the unipolar moment uh, uh, to a multipolar uh, States. And often they say uh, the sort of withdrawal of Afghanistan was the manifestation of that. But we have to remember that the United States continue to remain the only power currently which can actually mount uh, 
a military, uh, you call it invasion or attack, in three fronts. No other country in the world has that capacity to sustain that kind of a military action. So geopolitics is basically military, mm -hmm. although economics is, is part of it. So that's where it is. Now, what we are seeing, we are sort of a, in the middle of a two transformation. One is that the world order, which was established after the World War, Second World War, is collapsing, changing, because the United States and the values and the interests based on which the international relations or order was established is no longer possibly could uh, manage the global processes of today. But normally uh, international order goes through such, an, such transformation only through a war in the past. This is the first time we are seeing there is no major global war, but the order is changing. So since the order is changing without a war, now where is the chemistry? Who is going to take over? From whom? That's not defined. And that's why we see a lot of ambiguities and confusions. And often we say in the international relations that we are in between two orders. One collapsed, collapsing, and the other we don't know how it looks like. In the midst of it, we have to see us and internationals. So that's one. Why South Asia? Uh, the center of uh, political and economic gravity has shifted from uh, West to Europe to Asia. It, in fact, Asia was the center of both the political and economic power about 350 years back, where this part used to produce uh, more than 50% of the world GDP. And these are available statistics. It has gone from there to Middle East and to Europe and to United States, and now it is coming back. So that's something uh, we, we need to look at, and everybody looking at uh, Indo-Pacific or Asia-Pacific. But within that, there's two very important area, which was important 350 years back. is the Bay of Bengal and the South China Sea. These were very critical in those days and continue to remain very critical. These were not only in terms of maritime, but also in terms of productions. There was two centers which produced most of the wealth for the British Empire. One is the Punjab, United Punjab. The other was the United Bengal, where Bangladesh was a very integral part of that economy. So what I'm suggesting that, that you know, his, not only history repeats itself, but also economy repeats itself. So that's why there's so much of interest in South Asia. Now, there was some bit of a mistake that Americans made after the World War II, but they thought, or they possibly gave, it, gave the South Asia and part of uh, Southeast Asia to, you know, to UK to take care of it because of the colonial presence. And, and they withdraw actually uh, to Middle East and other places. But after 71, it's a, it's a very significant departure in American foreign policy. In 71, for the first time, they realized that they have not much control on South Asia, especially in the Bay of Bengal. Because in 71, if you recall, when, before they sent their seventh fleet, the Soviet, uh, Soviet submarines were old, already there and which they were not aware of. So that was the time they started revisiting that South Asia has to be brought under their influence. Where is Bangladesh in election? Election is a very integral part of not only governance, but also geopolitics. And there is currently two models of geopolitics and, uh, and uh, um, economy uh, or governance floating. One, the very Western model, which is called uh, based on the Washington consensus. You know, there will be a, it's basically a new liberal economy. There will be elections. There will be rule of law, uh, uh, rule by uh, consent of the people. But there's also another very important model emerging, which is called Beijing consensus where party is very important. It is basically a governance system based on Communist Party of China. They are more important, they are more significant than the government. So the, and, and, and the first time the world has seen there are multiple models of governance. So when you talk about democracy and elections, it's not the only way of governing Western way, but there are multiple ways. And which one will eventually uh, survive, we don't know yet. So that's why 
is not only geopolitically, but also in terms of elections and, and governance, we are also going through, uh, going through major uh, changes. I leave it there. Let's go into the dialogue and we'll, we'll see how it emerges. Thank you. Well, Mr. Shahidul Haq, we are going for a short break and come to you again. You. Well, viewers, we are going for a short break and come to you again very soon. Thank you. Well, we are back to the talk show Promising Bangladesh, sponsored by Crown Cement. And we were having talks with two giant diplomats of Bangladesh, one Mr. Tohid Hussain and other being Mr. Shahidul Haq. Both of them were Foreign Secretary. Well, Mr. Tohid Hussain, you know very well that we have many problems with Myanmar, especially Rohingya. And America has passed a bill, that is Burma Act. What is your understanding about the consequence of this bill, the effect on Bangladesh? Well, Mr. Shahidul Haq had been very intricately involved, very intensively involved in the whole affair of the Rohingyas. Yeah. I'm sure he can, light, uh, he can uh, throw more light on it. But as I see it from the outside, is that the, this is the, perhaps the most serious uh, problem that Bangladesh has had uh, ever since its, its independence. Because uh, this is one problem that has been thrust on us. It's not us who did anything. It has, it's a problem that has been thrust on us. And second thing is that, uh, in the six plus years that uh, uh, the problem has started, uh, we have not been anywhere near a solution. We have had an agreement, there were negotiations, there were uh, ways how this is to be solved, etc. But in the uh, final tally, nothing has happened. Uh, not a single soul has gone back to their uh, home. The problem has been further compounded, uh, compounded by the uh, 1st February uh, 2022 coup in uh, Myanmar. Well, the Myanmar military was virtually in power, but there was, there was some sort of uh, semi-civilian uh, rule by uh, Aung San Suu Kyi. That also uh, was just uh, uh, set aside completely by the uh, Tatmadaw. Um, the Tatmado is, uh, and now there is all over this opposition against the Tatmado all over the country. Now, there is a qualitative difference between what used to be opposition to the military rule earlier and now. For the first time, the majority Bamar population have also called for an uh, armed struggle against the military. This has never happened before. There were, uh, you know, problems, there were um, movements against the military sometimes. Uh, and in favor of democracy, etc. But n never the majority community had taken up arms against their military. But this is for the first time this has happened. And there is a, you know, this NUG, uh, the National Unity Government, uh, formed by the uh, elected representatives who have, whose election was nullified by the, uh, by the military. And they have formed a government. So it's a completely different ball game now. And besides, uh, the military is suffering setbacks in many of the areas, including losing, losing some of the uh, ground, some of the towns elsewhere. So we are at, a, at a, uh, a situation in which China is actually on both sides. Now coming to the, uh, coming to the Burma Act of the USA, what they have allowed is that, uh, without going into the details, that they have said that non-lethal assistance to the insurgents, insurgent groups. Now, non-lethal assistance, uh, how you explain it is a, it's a different thing, one. The second thing is that uh, even if they get non-lethal as uh, assistance, they need beyond weapons many other things. If they can get it from the US, that is always good for them. But we must remember that the Chinese are also involved with the other side. So uh, it's not sure what's exactly going to happen there. Um, besides, although the NUZ has for the first time, recognized the Rohingyas as the Rohingyas. No other authority in Burma had ever accepted that they used the term Rohingya. They are the first one who have done it. And they have issued at least two, or maybe three, I don't know exactly, at least two statements specifically for the Rohingyas, in which they have assured them that they will have rights and uh, you know, security back there. And they have invited them to join their struggle. 
as far as I know, uh, we have not so far helped them to uh, be part of the NUG. Uh, but uh, that is there. I do not think, uh, Shoy Tulak may, may be able to correct me if I'm wrong, I do not think that the uh, Tatmadaw is going to be militarily defeated and uh, this NUG coming to power in, uh, in Young Honor, uh, Nepido, whatever it is. Um, in my opinion, this, uh, this solution of the present state of civil war in uh, Myanmar is going to come to an end someday in a uh, negotiating table. And uh, it will depend on which party is having the upper hand at that moment of negotiation. And uh, in, in a possible negotiating table, two factors will be important for us. I, why I'm explaining this is that this is all related to the Rohingya problem also for us. One is that uh, will or can the NUG deliver what they are promising now, that a uh, rights and security and return of the Rohingyas to their land. It's both whether they are, will be willing to do it and whether they will be able to do it. Both are questionable. One. Second, a very important player has emerged. Uh, it's not very new, but then it had become prominent uh, of late, which is uh, the Arakan Army, AA. Now, Arakan Army is probably at this moment, if we leave aside the um, war state, Arakan Army is probably the most strongest of the insurgent groups. <coughs> they have, it is believed that they have about 20,000 troops, quite well trained and uh, with experience of fighting. They are, they are fighting all over. They are fighting in the current area, they are fighting in the, in the northeastern areas, whereas they are actually, uh, their in, area of interest is the southeast uh, or northeast, um, sorry, northwest, uh, which is uh, the Rakhine state along the Bay of Bengal. Now, um, when and if there is a situation in which uh, there will be a resolution on the table, the support of or the position of AA Arakan Army will also be very important because they are um, known to be anti Rohingya, but of late, of late they have issued a statement in which they have said that they want the Rohingyas to be part of their administration, and they have used they have also for the first time used. I the will term come Rohingya. to you again this point, William. Mr. Shoydilok, you handled the matter for a long time. Then what is your over-understanding of the Kofi Annan report, Obama Act, and the references and approach of America towards Rohingya. <clears throat> they asked the Bangladesh government to accommodate them. How would you be review all these things? Okay. No, thank, thank you very much. I, I fully agree with uh, Secretary Tohit's explanation. I will not go into that area. I'll just flag two things. One is that the whole Rohingya issue is not a Rohingya issue. It's a humanitarian issue. It's a human rights issue. It's a geopolitical issue. Often we miss the third one, where actually the relevance of Bangladesh comes in very strongly, in addition to the hosting of Rohingya. So that's one. Second is, uh, we have to remember that this part, the Burma, part of Bangladesh, including Chittagong port and um, Mizoram, Nagaland, this area has always been a very tumultuous area. It's, it's called um, the new great game which is being played in addition to the drug smuggling. So, so it, has, it has not grown organically the way other areas have grown. That's one. The second is this, this uh, Burma and India where it interfaces is the place where watchers watched Chinese watcher watched what India is doing, and the Indian watcher watched what China is doing. And it goes to centuries back, not only in terms of strategic, but also in terms of innovation, business. That's, that's the level of interaction. And there's a lot of trust and mistrust simultaneously. If you go to the bordering districts of India and, and Myanmar and China, you will see that the flavor continues to remain as to who owns which business. And there's a lot of business going on in the... So it's much larger than ring issue and it's much larger than uh, anything else. Now, the question is, as I said, that when uh, British left and the Japanese left mm. after the Second World War, 
Americans did not come and occupy Burma. They left as it is to the military. And so is Bangladesh in terms of Pakistan <coughs> and India. So they, they left it to them. It's not that the British and, and, and Japanese withdrew and the American came and said, that, look, this is now. It, it was a possibility. Actually, Americans could say that this, this Burmese theater is our theater now. But they did not because they didn't see its strategic values in those days. So in these situations, if we look at uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the, the current situations, where I will not go into Segeti Tohit's uh, uh, explanation of things, I fully agree with it. Now, the surprising element was, which Segeti Tohit has pointed out, that never ever the Burmese military, Tatmadu, thought that their own ethnic people will stand against them. This has never been in the 500 years of history. They have always been very united against British, against Japanese, against Americans. But this is the first time they were surprised. But still there are research going on the why the Burmese people are standing against the Burmese population. So that's where the issue is. Now, one of the explanations is, is because of the globalization, because of the democracy, because of the test of the world. Because most of the people didn't know there's a world beyond Burma. It was so uh, sort of inclusive. So in this, now everybody's eyes is the, the theater, the new theater, I call it. The new theater, whose influence will be more important? Is it India? Because as you know, Mizoram, Nagaland, Monipur, connected. And we have to understand that Bur Burma has been a part of India for quite a long time till 1885 when they lost. Before that, it was under their administration. Not only that, when the British occupied it, they brought people from Bihar and Bengal and some from Uttar Pradesh, workers, to, to run part of Burma. So, you know, there, there, there is a history and there is also a connection. When Monipur goes into flame, they look at Myanmar, so what's happening? Because most of the insurgents are coming from there, including drug smuggling, the rest of it. So, in that, the America, for the first time, realized that in this theater, they were nowhere to be seen. So, and, and Burma Act type act is not new. It, it was also enacted for Syria. Now, the extent of influence of Burma Act will depend how Congress will play its cards, how much money would be flowed in. This year, first time allocation has been made, number one. Number two, whose support they will get. Because certainly the Chinese will not have Americans to come and create a sphere of influence there. It is India. I doubt whether India will allow that to happen because they know they have the seven sisters, especially Monipur, Mizoram, and Nagaland. These are also very precariously they are uh, managing a balance and they don't want uh, outsiders to come and, and create, a, uh, create a situation. That is Bangladesh. Bangladesh uh, has not been very open to the whole idea that Bangladesh should be the corridor to implement Burma Act. So that's where it stands. And that's why it's, it's not only Bangladesh's economic advancement or not, also because of that, Bangladesh has become very important strategically. If Bangladesh said, OK, we will help Americans to implement the Burma Act, you'll see a different scenario. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. We will go for a short break. Viewers, we are going for a short break and come to you very soon. Viewers, we are back again to the talk show Promise Bangladesh, sponsored by Crown Cement. And we are having talks with two giant diplomats of Bangladesh, that is former Foreign Secretary Mr. Tohid Hussain and former Secretary Shohidul Haq. Mr. Tohid Hussain, this is our last part of the talk show. You know very well that government 12th election to the 12th parliament is over. And we are having the new cabinet and new council ministers. You know, the challenges before Bangladesh, globally, regionally, bilaterally, huge. What is your overall observation for the government coming in? Okay, thank you. Uh, I think the external um, issues are quite intricately related to our internal problems also. 
Uh, although uh, the government is yet to uh, recognize or uh, accept the, the fact, uh, our economy is in a pretty precarious situation. Uh, the price hike of essentials, um, then the issue of reserve, and the upcoming issues of uh, payments for, the, uh, for various projects which have already started and which are going to become more voluminous as the days pass. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think I look at it in, in this way that we have to pay to our uh, creditors or uh, with whom we are the traitors. We have to pay back in foreign currency. It's mostly to the east, Chinese. Uh, well, Russia is not east for us, but then it's towards the, it's considered part of the east. But we have to earn the money from the west because our market is in US and EU uh, for our almost loan uh, item that we export. Now, uh, as such, what I feel is that we cannot afford to have an adversarial or problematic relations with the West. Now, on the issue of these elections, let us accept the reality that we have been having some problems with the West, in our relations with the West. Um, and I would also say that the issue has not been handled very well by us uh, to uh, accept the reality. So in that case, what I feel is that the challenge for the government will be to amend the situation and establish a um, cordial working relations with the West, even if they differ on issues. That is always there. You don't always have to agree on everything. But uh, government must take initiative to establish a relation so that our economic relations with the West doesn't suffer. Now, from the point of view of the West, we have seen the reaction. They have not accepted that this has been, uh, the elections has been free and fair. They have already made it clear. Uh, but there is still no indication in their initial reactions that they are going to take any action on this. Although there had been some indications earlier on, before the elections. Now, I think we have to see that how the, uh, the scenario develops. Uh, how seriously the West takes up the issue of uh, elections, which in their opinion is, has not been free and fair, and uh, how our, com our government, how it handles that situation. Uh, if there is uh, no amendment of the problem that has arisen, we are, uh, I believe that we will be in for serious difficulties because any sort of even partial uh, restrictions on our uh, trade, if that happens, uh, that will lead to a lot of loss of job, not only a loss of US dollars that would be coming in, but loss of jobs and that might create even social problems for us because uh, about four to five million girls are working in this sector, in the, in the government sector. And any, uh, already in, in, in some of the markets, the uh, exports have slightly come down. And if it, there is a major uh, problems in that, in that area, um, and girls start losing their job, that will create a serious problems for us. Thank you very much. Mr. Shohidul Haq, you are talking about Burma Act. Again, I come to you on the same issue. And do you think Burma Act ultimately shall have effect on Bangladesh? Uh, very good uh, question. In fact, it's, it's not only a Burma Act. There are multiple sort of a development that's taking place in South Asia, in the Bay of Bengal, which will have an impact on Bangladesh. It's not new. You know, it, it reminds me, and when I read history, uh, going back to 71, Bangladesh born out of a Cold War. It was a product of geopolitics, mm -hmm. steam geopolitics, West versus the East. And when it was liberated, 
Bangladesh, the then government under the leadership of Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman did survive extreme hostile environment and Bangabandhu did navigate very carefully between Americans, between the, between China, China wasn't with us in those days, between the Middle East, between the India and, uh, and, and Soviet Union. But see how he was successful in laying bricks for future of Bangladesh. So that's what I'm saying that it needs to do some bit of a course correction. I fully uh, agree with uh, Secretary Tawhid that uh, unless we do that, you know, it's not that Bangladesh will disappear. We'll have much more difficult. The takeoff position for any country like airplanes, the most vulnerable type. If you cannot put the full throttle, you collapse. I don't think it will happen, but course correction is very important and critical. It's not only economy, but also geopolitics. You know, often in the international politics, if you talk too much about economics, they said, stop it. It's politics that you're talking about because in every economy there's a politics and that's the geopolitics. So having said this, let me also tell you what course connection that I, I, was, I was thinking of. One is that, you know, you can say that, you know, business as usual. The way we have been running, we will continue to run that. We should look at our neighbor, India, 71. History says that, you know, United States identified uh, India as their enemy in this part. And now they are the best of the best friends. They, they are sharing nuclear technology, which they haven't even shared with the European countries. So see how things could change if you do a course correction. That could be a possibility. And you have a friend which has always been a friend of Bangladesh, India. The big support. But India had none to build the relationship with the United States and the, and the Western world. So that's one. So business as usual is subtly not the way. So what we do? We can either, it's a, it's a, it's a, we call it uh, uh, sort of a, not, uh, ref, it's, it's a point when you cannot go on a straight line. Either you have to go up or down because you have uh, been uh, intervened with a barrier. So going up, you have to reinforce the engagement. And, and that's possibility. If Cuba can do it, the whole world can do it. That's one. The other one is that, no, we, we give, give damn to anything. We're not going to sort of uh, take care of anything. Uh, we, we sort of uh, de-link, decouple, de-engage, whatever you say. So there's two ways. In which way uh, Bangladesh will go have to be decided by the political master. Those who have now got the people's mandate to run the country for the next five years, they will have to decide as to which way they want the country and the people to go. But Bangladesh has huge possibilities, huge potentials to make a breakthrough. And whenever you grow, even in the village context, any, anyone who is growing fast, others will try and snap that particular person or the family down. It's very normal. It's the power politics. Geopolitics is nothing but the power politics. And who plays the power politics? It plays by political elite, business elite, military elite, and intellectual elite. There's a four classes of elite that play that power politics. They have to have a discussion and say that which way we want to take our country. We look forward to for a brighter Bangladesh, which Bangabandhu always uh, imagined visioned we should go back the way he has changed his course in terms of running Bangladesh in a very critical period when we had nothing almost. Thank you. Very now much. we have everything. So we Thank should do better. Much, uh, Thank you very much, Mr. Tawhid Dulak. Uh, Mr. Tawhid Hussain, you are at the final stage of the talk show. What is your focus about the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Diplomacy? for the coming days? Well, this is something very difficult. So one thing we must remember that uh, the foreign ministry uh, per se doesn't determine the foreign relations. Foreign relations is, a, is, the, uh, is the outcome of the decisions of the entire government, of course, uh, from the highest level. 
Foreign Ministry, what it can do is that from its experience, from its uh, knowledge base, they can suggest what should be done. But it's the highest political authority who will always take the decision. In consonance with uh, all the ministry in the parliamentary system, you know, there is uh, this uh, uh, joint responsibility. So uh, ultimately, it is the government's decision which the foreign ministry implements. Foreign ministry, of course, influences the process of decision making also. But it's not absolute. So what I feel is that the uh, the the basic premise about which Mr. Shridhar has mentioned that there are two ways to go from here. Uh, the our political bosses will have to decide which way to go. Then we have a professional uh, core of diplomats who will implement that decision. But uh, I think the basic uh, starts with that: that uh, what the government decides whether to go business as usual and just not care about what's happening or take a proactive stand to uh, to engage those who really matter in the world and those who matter for us. Thank you very much. Mr. Soyuzlok, last question to you. You had been to the chair of the Foreign Secretary for a long time. And do you think the Standing Committee of the Minister of Foreign Affairs should be more proactive and should be more vocal about the foreign policy of Bangladesh and its implementation also? Uh, thank you very much. Um, you know, uh, I mean, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, there is a bureaucratic structure and there is a political structure. You know, the top is the foreign minister. Uh, the standing committees in the parliament plays a very critical role because that's where actually you are grilled. I, I, <laughs> I've been grilled a number of times uh, in terms of our, our policy. So that's a very good platform where you had the opportunity as a bureaucrat to offer scenarios. And not only scenarios, these consequences and fallout of the scenario a b c that what you adopt is not only a policy but it will have to have to face the consequences so that's a very good platform i think we should uh, we should continue to use it uh, and from there a lot of policy debates comes out because that's the place where the politicians interfaces with the uh, with the with the diplomats bureaucrats uh, good platform but uh, how useful that is will only depend on the political masters. But let me differ uh, with uh, Secretary Tawheed. The foreign office of any country has a very critical role in terms of maintaining the foreign relations. So I think uh, that's equally uh, applicable for Bangladesh. Thank you now, very much. If the foreign office cannot offer scenarios and the consequences, then political master will not be able to choose. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tohid Hussain and Mr. Shahid Lok. Viewers, we are at the end point of this talk show. And before ending this talk show, I have to summarize what the two giant diplomats